lot of other things. So please welcome Dr. Anderson. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Anna and uh, the Social Justice Center for inviting me to your chance to talk. Basically, I'm just going to call this a sketch of some of the interwoven parts of rape culture. Um, many of you are probably more advanced in your thinking on this subject than I am. Uh, this is an attempt uh, for me to work through a few things that I have been thinking about some. Uh, as Amna said, I am interested in coercion as a philosophical topic and how that works and, and social power more generally. Uh, I've written on things that are related to this, but I haven't ever tried to write something to explain or, or uh, systematize my thinking on, on rape culture. Um, and I, I find that much about rape culture that I hear is puzzling to me. Uh, not that I have any doubt that such a thing exists or that it affects uh, the lives of women in particular, and, and men, of course. Um, but uh, it, I think uh, it's unclear to me how we can understand why it persists in the face of some very strong critiques of it and in the face and given the fact that there aren't really any advocates for it under that term. Uh, so I'm trying to in some way figure out what is the dynamic of it and what is it that people are doing as they understand it that perpetuates it. Uh, since I don't think that uh, many of the people who, who are doing things that are a part of it Laura's presentation suggested that uh, this director has written the script I am, uh, that, that she found very objectionable and that very, probably was very objectionable. It's probably the case that he didn't understand it in those terms that, you know, that would make it possible for him to see what that would be contributing to rape culture. So I'm trying to figure out how, how that gap in understanding comes in and what we could do that might clarify that addressing it. Um, uh, so I think you can, of course, uh, point to gender hierarchy as one of the background conditions for this. And I think you can also uh, point to heteronormativity as another thing that contributes to it. But I, I don't think that those two things by themselves give you an explanation for it, in part because it is either the case, I, I suspect it's the case, that there are places that have both of those things, uh, gender uh, hierarchy and uh, probably male gender domination, and also heteronormativity, but that don't have something like rape culture going on there. And maybe they've got something different that's worse, uh, because there's either no sexual freedom or very limited sexual freedom. Or e even if there is no such place that we could find on the map that, that avoids this, I think you can at least imagine what it would be like for a place to have those two things, and yet there not be this persistent pattern of uh, treating women as things that uh, can be raped without impunity and so forth. And given how, I mean, we, we certainly know that things are not perfect here now, but given that we have made a great deal of progress towards gender equality over my span of my lifetime, and give another decade or two to that, now, then you will find the culture in these parts now certainly pays lip service to it. I think, in fact, gives a much greater uh, role of equality to women. And yet, statistics show us that rape as a phenomenon has changed not a great deal in its, its uh, uh, incidence. So I'm curious as to, uh, despite all of that change and despite our ideals, what is it that, that keeps us in place? Um, so I want to talk about a few of what I might just call the constituent aspects of our heterosexual culture that give us some insight into how and why rape culture persists and to talk a little bit about what it would take to overcome it. And this is not a bit of social science. This is a, more or less my trying to fumble through some, some archival data that I have in my mind and, and try to piece together a, a story that seems to make some sense to me uh, and it may turn out in discussion here that it makes no sense at all. Uh, it's certainly not the sort of thing that a, a reputable social scientist could say, oh, okay, here I've got my reasons. And, uh, so, so I've been defended on the basis of that. 
Um, rather, I'm, I'm trying to just make sense of some, some, some big picture things that I think fit together and make some sense of it. Um, because many sexual assaults are themselves very complex events, I don't want to talk about sexual assaults per se and study those uh, directly. Uh, but rather, I want to talk about a few related cultural phenomena that I think might throw some light on the proclivity of some men to commit assault and the complicated conditions that make it hard to respond effectively to this fact. Um, so the first big uh, sort of anecdote, source of anecdotes that will help illustrate the kind of thing I'm thinking about is what we might just call uh, the surreptitious photography of women that takes place in, in our culture. Uh, a, a, a particularly uh, egregious and, and notorious example of this was uh, unearthed on this campus about a year and a half ago, if my memory serves, uh, with the uh, co a collection of men, I think, uh, at the time in the media, from what I understand, they were largely associated with the hockey team, uh, were uh, created a, some kind of a, an online thing that they call Dime Watch, Dime as in 10, as in place to post pictures taken surreptitiously of campus women who they thought, generally speaking, were conventionally attractive, and then to uh, make comments about them, and then also apparently to post pictures of women they did not find attractive and make comments about them. And this was a kind of, uh, some local network of men who were, who were sharing these images. Uh, as I understand it, and, and this is a little fuzzy now, and I think that a lot of information did not become official media, but uh, the, this was shared amongst them and then it became popular and more and more people started uh, finding their way to it and then it sort of blew up in their face and, and something happened administratively to put the kibosh on it. Um, and, but I mean, just the idea that there is something to be, some interest that a, a collection of uh, normatively heterosexual uh, upstanding men have in photographing without permission and consent, sharing those photographs amongst their buddies, commenting on them, and uh, then uh, taking in the adulation of others for having done so, uh, I think it is rather distinctive and interesting. Uh, this is a, a micro instance, but you can find many, many instances of this sort of thing going on. Uh, a story that has circulated and is a thing. Uh, hackers on, uh, with some computer skills finding ways to uh, co-opt the computers of uh, either friends or straight, most likely strangers on the internet where those computers have a webcam and then they uh, install what's sometimes called a RAT or a remote uh, administrative tool in order to turn on the webcam so that they can surreptitiously spy on somebody unaware that they are being uh, watched. And I mean, presumably much of what is seen then is quite boring, but at least some of it might, you might see somebody undressing in the bedroom if their computer happened to be located there. And there's a culture uh, that goes through doing this and sharing it. Uh, there are plenty of uh, online boards where people share images uh, taken of people in, in either surreptitiously or what are sometimes called upskirt photos. And Somebody was just, there was a court case that came up in uh, Massachusetts recently where a law against certain kinds of assault was shown not to apply to people taking uh, surreptitious photos upskirt on public transit. I, this is certainly not the worst thing that men do to women, but the idea that there is an interest in doing this, and given that, as we all know, there is no shortage of photos taken of women in all states of undress posted for free on the internet where these are entirely consensual. It is not as though one has to, has to go through this activity in order to have such photos to view, to share, to make comments about. There seems to be something about taking these images without the permission of the person that makes it especially valuable to lose something. I, I, um, so one of the things I take away from this is that there is, in this this demonstrates a desire to have unilaterally uh, 
somebody access to somebody else sexually because of course the person does not know this is happening and so this is a strictly one directional kind of access to them and it is to sexualize them without any reciprocal responsibilities or, or judgments that could be made uh, on their part about them or uh, responsibilities that might fall on them. Um, I see in this something similar or, or quite different in other respects with the proclivity of someone to uh, uh, sexually assault women through use of intoxicants, especially those that cause them to pass out into unconsciousness, where, uh, I mean, presumably that whatever joy there is in sexually assaulting somebody in that state is, is this could not possibly be good sex, whatever that is, uh, yet there is something desirable about it to, to those who do it. Uh, again, it seems to me that this is about having unilateral access to somebody that it is, uh, and it puts no uh, corresponding responsibilities or, or judgments on the part of doing it from the person they are sexualized. All right, second set of cases that, um, uh, or style of uh, action activity might be, is what we might call treating uh, sex and women as prizes. Um, if you go back to the Iliad, you get a clear illustration of the kind of thing I have in mind. Uh, the Iliad starts off in part because there is a few over whether uh, Agamemnon, the king of the Greeks, will have to give back his prize, which is a concubine that was captured in war, uh, because it turns out that Apollo was unhappy with uh, the uh, taking uh, the priest's daughter, uh, the Apollo's priest's daughter, and so Agamemnon feels dishonored by having to give back his prize and wants uh, Achilles to give up his uh, similar prize, right? So women, as we know, have been treated as prizes in combat, war, etc., for, for at least that long. Um, but, but I think that, is, that this is actually quite mundane in our culture. Uh, so if you look at the kind of uh, adulation that uh, sports stars, for instance, get for having extremely conventionally attractive girlfriends and the attention that we give to these women and the, the seeming entitlement that, that apparently uh, men in positions of power or, or social adulation uh, take as sort of like this is their due, uh, that they can expect women to uh, be sexually interested in them and, and then use them in all sorts of ways and even if they are not consenting, uh, this is taken to be well if you go to his hotel room, especially if it's that kind of guy, you know what he's expecting since this seems to be Right, uh, so that, that seems to be the cultural understanding of it. Uh, and of course, other tropes such as the idea of a trophy wife or some such thing. Um, uh, or the, the kind of thing that goes on in pickup culture, which I suspect you've heard of, uh, where, where the gain is to right, have as much access to women and, and sex as you can, and it is something like a prize that one receives. It might, in fact, mean that there's also interest in sex, but it seemed more like a competitive aspect in the sex and, and the access to women is something like the, the, the scoring mechanism for it. Um, and one of the interesting things about it is that, of course, there may be a, a payoff for sexual pleasure for the man involved in this, but it seems like a large part of the payoff is in the uh, corresponding uh, reputation that he gains amongst other men. Right? So to with them for this uh, measure, so, so this becomes a kind of measuring stick for one's self-worth amongst other men. Uh, just as the kind of contrast case to this, to, to, to where you have belief, uh, the idea of the guy who is a loser, a like sexual loser, is the kind of guy who can't get a girlfriend, who doesn't have as much sex as he wants, is in some sense uh, to be despised by those who do, um, and uh, so if you think of, some, I mean, uh, to play it out a little further, some of the stigma that's associated with masturbation for men is a way of sort of like relieving sexual tension without actually having scored the prize that, that uh, men are supposed to gain in order to, to, to have that. It seems as though, right, if what you wanted was an orgasm, those are easy to come by, but having it sort of like in a way that counts socially, that, that takes some a uh, third uh, area that, that fits, uh, builds to this picture is what we all know as slut shaming. Um, recently, a woman who is a student
student at Duke University, but who has a sideline in choreography, uh, was outed by students there. Uh, uh, her screen name, which is all that has been made public that I know of, is Belle Knox, uh, has a very, very interesting account of her, uh, the, what has happened to her since she was outed as a choreography person, and, and perhaps maybe the pithiest and also most telling uh, 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 takeaway that she has from it is, uh, she says, this is quoting her in an article on exojane.com, you want to see me naked, and then you want to judge me for letting you see me naked. Right? The, the idea being that there seems to be, uh, in the culture that she's dealing with, no contradiction between somebody wanting to have access to a woman's body, and then blaming her when, when she actually provides it. Uh, especially if she does it in, the way, in this way, as a sort of like dis decision based on a set of principles that she is comfortable with, and thinks that these actually make sense for her life. Um, so slut shaming is something we know happens to women quite frequently. Uh, if you look at women who, some young women especially, who have committed suicide as a result of having been sexually assaulted or otherwise uh, uh, had engaging in sexual activity, often this is due to a kind of bullying that points out to them uh, that they are no longer worth anything or are a slut or something like that, and this becomes too much for them. Uh, the, there, are, uh, there are innumerable other examples of this kind of thing. Um, and interestingly, uh, though I don't have an explanation exactly for but this sort of behavior of slut shaming does occur while perpetrated by both men and women. It's certainly not just men who do this, so you might say that they are in some ways more responsible, but women seem to hold other women to the same uh, set of standards as all women. So here, uh, thinking through this, what, what do I take away from it? Well, if, going back to the, the thing I said about women treated as prizes, uh, is, makes sense, and so if women are regarded as prizes in a kind of currency in uh, culture by which self-worth is measured among men, then women who exercise sexual agency or freedom tend to devalue that prize. And sort of like make the, the conquest itself uh, no longer the thing that it, that it was for men before that, and, and hence punishing and devaluing those women who take uh, sexual autonomy and choice into hand to make their own decisions here is a way to help maintain the value of those prices that are taken by conquest rather than by free reciprocal association. So it's a way of, of maintaining the value of, of that currency, so to speak, uh, by, by preventing sort of like free entry into that market on terms that are more favorable to the women. Uh, so, so those are my three big, big picture cases. That if we were to, to put all this together, it's clear that those will create incredibly perverse incentives both for men and women. Um, so, so, so take that as what I, uh, some evidence for, for how things work. What I want to ask now, and I'll we'll spend just a few minutes on is how did these translate into rape, uh, translate rape culture into actual sexual assaults? Um, let me say that Again, this is it's bad social science, but may be true. Uh, you can perhaps group men in this population into three rough categories. Uh, one who are absolutely appalled at this dynamic I've just described, and who actively resist it, uh, and resist contributing to it. Um, those are, are the people I think Laura has asked us to be. Uh, secondly, the relatively few uh, men who we could be, I think, clearly regard as sexual predators and who willingly and uh, are, are willing and able to commit assault when the opportunity arises. Uh, and those are, are perhaps responsible for most sexual assaults, so probably not all, but a very small sliver of the male population probably does much more of this than, than uh, any other and then we have in between the bulk of the male population who do not recognize the situation in general as a problem, but who are not actively seeking to coerce women into non-consensual sex. Um, it's the last group of guys who play the game, if, if you will, 
as culture has defined it, and though they may push the boundaries a bit and make use of what advantages the state provides them, they do not actively seek to coerce anyone into sex, nor would they see themselves as prey on them. Um, these guys are, these are guys, however, who do link their self-worth to their sexual experiences, who take advantage of what sometimes called the male protection racket, the advantages provided to the so-called good guys by the fact that there are bad guys out there for whom we need protection, uh, and who probably can actually sympathize to some extent with other similar guys, including some of those sexual predators, and who largely support the status quo. So it's some, something like that big cohort of men that I think uh, are, are present the most interesting problem for it seems to, so it seems to me that effective opposition to rape culture involves two main tactical targets. First, of course, working to deter those who knowingly intentionally engage in predation. And then secondly, aiming to reshape the attitudes and incentives among the larger group of men who serve as enablers for the others and for the predators with respect to competition on or in the field of sex, the sexual exploitation of women. Um, the larger, the, the latter target, the, how to change what's going on with this a larger group of men is the harder target, I think, to, to actually address. What they're doing is not generally illegal, so the law is not going to be the first uh, line of defense there. But one part of it, and this is where I'll just leave it as a thing to think about today, is to find ways to revise uh, the cultural construction of women's sexuality as a kind of prize or currency for the assertion of men's self-worth. Uh, I think that there's lots that goes into that that is uh, pernicious, but that it's the sort of thing that uh, comes out of maybe Jane's talk and Lauren's talk, that this is part of our cultural construction here of women, uh, that perhaps we can find ways to try to address that. If we can, if we can change that bit, then I think we can change both the possibilities for sexual agency as well as the incentives for, for men who are trying to keep score with each other and such one using women as a sort of uh, markers of that success. All right, so that's what I want to say. Okay.